Um, soy el Pau, el coordinador del GAC, y os voy a dar la bienvenida a esta Masterclass GAC del 2019, on tindrem amb nosotros, como ya ja sabeu, a John Borjaus, una figura icónica, de aquí probablemente todos ya ja lo llegit, o estudiat el llibre y muchos habré probablemente aprendido a hacer riure, en part gracias a él, y tenemos el gran honor de que hoy estiguem nosotros. La gran mayoría de los que somos aquí son sou socios del GAC, los que no hi, mm, sou guionistas, pues ya ja trigueu. Uh, no digo nada más, os dejo mal John, muchas gracias a todos. Uh, just so I know, how many of you define yourselves as guionistas? Okay. Uh, producers? Network executives? Good, we can make jokes about them. Um, or none of the above? Stand-up comics? One or two of those? Okay. Well, I hope to have a little bit of something for everyone here today. Uh, but obviously, if there's something that you would like me to go into more detail on, I will be happy to do that. I have some points that I want to make, some information that I want to share, but I also want to leave plenty of time for question and answer dialogue. This is my opportunity to learn about you and the challenges you face in your market and your business, so I will try to learn enough to be a good uh, servant to you. I wish to start by thanking interpreters for doing their wonderful and thankless job. We mess with you, but we love you. Uh, thanks to Pau for his support in bringing me here today. Thanks to the GAC for thinking this, this was a good idea. Uh, we hope that none of their official representatives will be here to find out that it was a very, very bad idea. <laughs> All right, my name is John Vorhaus. I come from Los Angeles, California. I've been a professional writer and teacher of writers for my God, four decades. Uh, that's quite a long time. It's given me the opportunity to build up a strong body of experience. I've had a lot of successes and quite a few failures. I'm going to share with you today a little bit about what it means both to succeed and to fail as a creative person and as a writer. My uh, intention here today is to give you, as I like to put it, rules, tools, and a good swift kick in the motivation. I want you to come out of this experience excited and inspired and ready to write. To help you do this, I'm going to try to make some things that you thought were fairly complex, simple. I'm going to try to give you some hard, simple pieces of information that you can use day in and day out, not just to write comedy, but to write anything at all. Uh, often you will hear me uh, say something that sounds like it means something. <coughs> Friends say that I have a gift for reducing complex concepts to trivial one-liners. And when I have reduced something to a trivial one-liner, I will call attention to it. And I will call this thing a grab. I'm not sure what you do with the word grab uh, to hold on to. Um, in my personal slang, a grab is a small idea that represents a big idea or a small solution that solves a number of big problems. We'll jump right into the first one. This is where our understanding of comedy begins. Comedy is truth and pain. If you know the underlying truth and pain of any human moment, you can predict what will be funny about that moment. This is a powerful idea. Who thinks they're naturally funny? <laughs> Not too many people raise their hand. I think I'm naturally funny. But I support my natural funniness with a lot of technology, a lot of strategy, a lot of tools. This is the first, this is the biggest. Comedy is truth and pain. In any human moment, there is an underlying truth and an associated pain with the moment. I was asking myself, as I always do, how can I demonstrate this principle in a way that everyone will easily understand? Today, I can do it in two words. Donald Trump. Hey, uh, just to give a heads up, this uh, whiteboard marker will not last the hour. So if we can get a, uh, see if we can find another one. You're saying there are more or you're asking me to turn around? Okay. What is the truth and pain of our experience of Donald Trump? I'm not even speaking about politically. Some of you 
No, I'm sure none of you are. <laughs> I don't know anybody who is. What is the truth of our experience with Donald Trump? He is a massive, uncontrolled force that's loose on the world. And what is the pain? He might destroy us all. So anytime we're making a joke about Donald Trump, we are tapping into the truth and pain of our commonly held experience. When I speak of truth in this sense, I'm not speaking of fact necessarily, but rather the opinion that we share. For instance, um, here in Catalonia, do you tell jokes about people from other parts of Spain? Can somebody give me an example of one of those jokes? <laughs> uh, all right, then I'll share one with you, which will illustrate a couple of points. Um, in the north, or in Russia, they tell jokes about the Chukchi people, the indigenous people who live in the Arctic regions. And a typical Chukchi joke goes like this. Chukchi walks into a television store and says, do you have any color televisions? And the store owner says, yes, of course we do. Chukchi says, great, I will have a green one. What does this tell us about the way the Russians look at those people? Not that they are like that, but that the group as a whole sees them this way. They're not smart, and we have to put up with them. Uh, here's a joke you may have heard that they tell about Argentinians. Any Argentinians here? I've, oh, it's worth asking. How did the Argentinian commit suicide? Climbed to the top of his ego and jumped off? <laughs> it wasn't the fall that killed him. He died of starvation on the way down. <laughs> the truth and pain for people in other parts of South America, Argentinians have big egos and we suffer. We have to put up with their arrogance at our expense. This is the math of truth and pain. Now let's bring it into this room. I'm a teacher in a classroom. What is my truth and pain? What do I want to have happen? Anybody? I don't want silence. I want people to laugh. And I fear that they won't laugh. So the truth is, I'm here to do a job. And the pain is, I am insecure about my ability to do the job. This is a little bit of a lie. I'm not insecure. I'm a trained professional and incredibly well-dressed man. So, so I have nothing to fear. What is your truth in pain? Well, let me see if I can demonstrate it. What's your name? Marta. Marta. What is your feeling right now? Uh, I'm okay. I'm, you're okay, okay. Is anybody a little nervous? Some people in this situation are nervous. They are afraid that teacher is going to call on them, ask them to be funny. So I have an underlying truth and pain inside my head. You have an underlying truth and pain inside your head. Let's go out into the street. Let's imagine that we are stuck in traffic. You're a driver stuck in traffic. What is the driver's truth? I'm stuck in traffic. And what's the pain? I'm going to be late for something important. If I have these two pieces of information, there's a driver stuck in traffic who doesn't want to be late. I have all the weaponry I need to destroy that man. And ladies and gentlemen, oh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to embark upon a mission to destroy someone. <laughs> Just checking to see if it's a whiteboard marker. You always want to know. Because comedy is truth and pain, but guess what? Comedy also, comedy is cruelty. Comedy is cruelty. A thing isn't funny to the person it's happening to. It's funny to the people watching. Every film comedy, every stage comedy, every stand-up, every uh, television show is based on the idea of let's watch someone suffer. So I'm going to give you some tools in the next few minutes that will help you be very effective at helping someone suffer. But before I do that, I need to lay a certain emotional platform down. Because we're writers. We avoid conflict for a living. 
If we loved conflict, we would be diplomats or car salesmen or Donald Trump. We're writers. We like to be by ourselves, doing our thing. We don't necessarily, naturally embrace conflict. We don't like to be cruel. It's important to remember that characters in stories are not real people. It's okay to hurt them. It's not only okay to hurt them, it's what makes comedy work. A thing isn't funny to the person it's happening to, it's funny to the people watching, that's why we do it. I'm a teacher in a classroom, what do I want? I want you to learn, I want you to be attentive, I want you to get satisfaction from this experience. Now let's say that you wanted to be cruel to me. What could you do to make me suffer? Anybody? Sorry? Talking to each other, what else? Mm -hmm. Nobody will react. I tell a joke and nobody laughs. That seems like the worst thing that could happen to me <laughs> right now, so please don't do that. <laughs> if you know it's funny, laugh. If you think it's funny, laugh. If you're not sure, laugh. <laughs> if you know for sure it's not funny, still laugh. <laughs> because you're nice people and you don't want me to suffer. But if you wanted me to suffer, you easily could just by asking the following question. What does he want? How can I keep him from having it? I often describe it this way, and you can think of this as a grab. A character has a piece, that is P-E-A-C-E, -E, that he wants to achieve. I want to fulfill my desire in this moment and experience peace. As a comic creator, as someone writing comedy, your job can be thought of as attacking the character's piece. This is profound, if you think about it. Your job isn't to be funny. Your job is just to pick a target and hit it hard. Everything okay in there? Not talking too fast? Okay. Let's imagine that we're looking at a preacher in church giving a sermon. What does the preacher want? He wants... Yeah? He, he wants to, to uh, inspire the congregation. He wants them to believe what he believes. He wants to be respected, understood, honored. Now, just randomly, we can think of a lot of ways to attack this character's peace. What can we do to a preacher uh, preaching a sermon? Get up and walk out. What else? Whistle. Laugh, whistle, uh-huh. What, sleep? Laugh, laugh, oh, laugh, right, because he's not going for laughs, he's going for inspiration. And you can see that it's pretty easy to come up with ways to attack the target just randomly, just by saying, well, what could happen? But what I want to show you in the next few minutes is you don't have to be random in your attacks. You can be very strategic in your attacks. And by adopting this strategy, you will find yourself not with one joke or five jokes or even ten jokes, but an unlimited potential number of jokes, all based on the following proposition. If a problem is hard to solve, you can make it easier to solve simply by making it a smaller, more targeted, more specific problem. And the way that I do this is through the use of these things called comic tools. Oh, this is going to be... All right, I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. I'm going to use the flip chart. Oh, no, I'm not. They took the flip chart. I, I said, no, 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 don't bother. Don't bother. I said, don't give me a flip chart. I can't be trusted with flip charts. And it's true. I would make a mess of it. But we'll do the best we can. Here is a comic tool. Exaggeration. We all know that there's a relationship between comedy and exaggeration. We see it all the time. Uh, it has been said that drama is just, oh, sorry, that comedy is just drama plus exaggeration, which is a good way to think about it. But let's think about exaggeration as a weapon in our hands. 
A preacher is talking to a congregation, and he wants to preach the Word of God. Now, when we think about exaggeration, we are thinking about taking things out of normal and into abnormal. What is the normal number of people in a church? 50, 100, some reasonable number, some reasonable relationship between the space available and the size of the crowd. Using exaggeration as a tool, we can increase the number so that instead of 50 people, there are 500 or 5,000. We can use exaggeration in the other direction, decreasing the number of people so that there are 10, 5, 2, 1, nobody. Just doing these two things, we can attack the character in two ways. We can put in too many people. How will that impact his peace? By making it very, very difficult for him to communicate, just get his word across, there's just too many people. Or we can subtract everybody from the room. We can exaggerate toward the minimum and leave him with nobody to preach to. Already we have two ways to make the situation funny to the viewers who are ready to laugh at the expense of the poor preacher who now can't get his word across. Now, this is exaggeration in terms of the number of things. But we don't have to exaggerate just the number of things. We can also exaggerate the quality of things. For instance, the temperature in this room is about right. It's a little bit warm, but not too warm. But we can exaggerate the warmth of the room to the point where it's as hot as an inferno. What negative effect would that have on our, pre on our preacher? How would that hurt him? He's sweating. Just think about that. I want you to hear the word of God, but I'm drenched with sweat. I'm suffering. People will take off their clothes. Man, what's your name? Jordy. Jordy. Thank you. You're about three steps ahead of me. Uh, that's a great answer. People will take off their clothes because it's too hot. In fact, I'm going to have to catch up to you, and I will in just a second. What if we exaggerate the other way? What if we make it too cold? Everybody's frozen. They, it's just too cold to stay in a place. So we can exaggerate the size of things, the number of things, the quality of things. In a minute, we'll also discover that we can exaggerate the attitude that people have. But right now, let's just think about impacting the physical environment. Using the tool of exaggeration, we can turn things up or turn things down. Does this mean that everything we come up will be come up with will be funny, not necessarily. At this point, I will introduce to you, those of you who have not read the Comic Toolbox, I will introduce to you the famous rule of nine. The rule of nine says, for every 10 jokes we try, nine won't work. Wow, let's think about that for a second. For every 10 jokes we try, nine won't work. That sounds like an awful lot of failure, doesn't it? That sounds like an awful lot of misery. You wouldn't accept that success rate in sport or sex or some other high stakes environment. Why is it okay in comedy? Well, here's why. Let's suppose I have one joke, just one joke. How much of my ego do I have to invest in that joke? It's math, all of it. 100% of my ego has to go into that one joke. Now suppose I have 10 jokes. How much of my ego do I have to invest in each of these jokes? Only 10%, right? And since it only has to work once, I don't have to fear failure. This is a, a real important point. I want to underscore it. We who write jokes for a living fear failure. We fear to tell jokes that don't work. We escape this fear by recognizing that most of the time the jokes won't work. We'll turn up the temperature in the church, doesn't really work. Turn down the temperature, doesn't really work. For one reason or another, just not funny. If we can reach a point in our heads and hearts where we're okay with that, with that level of failure, then we are free to do what we need to do, which is to create without consequence, to have the freedom to try to solve the problem a lot of different ways. All right. Now we're starting to get some equipment 
on our side. We know our goal, attack the character's peace. We have a weapon at our disposal, exaggeration, and we also have the willingness to fail, the willingness to take a lot of shots at the same target, knowing that we really only have to hit the target once or twice. I hope, even now, that you're feeling a certain sense of liberation, a certain sense of freedom that comes from knowing you don't have to be funny, you just have to solve a problem. Creative people carry such a burden, and if you carry this burden, my heart goes out to you because I carry the same burden. I have to get it right. I have to be funny. I have to succeed creatively. What is the consequence of that burden? It makes it hard for me to perform. If I'm worried about failure, it's very hard for me to succeed. The minute I detach from the need to succeed, it becomes easier to succeed. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say it right to the camera. The minute we detach from the need to succeed, we make it easier to succeed. This is really just a matter of relaxing. We use tools because it gives us a way of hitting the target over and over again. We define the problem in narrow terms to make the target easier to hit over and over again. And we support the whole thing with an attitude of, the worst that can happen to me is I fail, and I'm probably going to fail most of the time anyhow. Suddenly, we have some room to move. And so now, we will take Jordi's idea of taking off some clothes. Well, we're going to call it a tool, and that tool is taboo. <coughs> Let me tell you something about comedy, folks. Comedy begins where tolerance ends. If you push people to the point where they start to feel uncomfortable, you set them up to laugh. Why? What else can we do using just the tool of taboo to make this character suffer? Sorry? One, it, the audience is our kids. Our, our, uh, kids. 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 Oh, kids. Uh, sure, because it's bad enough for adults to be naked, but adults plus kids plus nudity equals jail sentence. <laughs> right? More tension. What you're doing right there is also a comic tool or strategy. You're making a bad situation worse. This is another one of these ideas that turns everything upside down. We think we have to be funny. We don't have to be funny. All we have to do is make a bad situation worse. Attack the character's piece, attack it again, attack it from another angle, attack, attack, attack. Move him further and further and further from his piece by the simple act of making a bad situation worse. In the second half of the presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about story structure. But just to jump ahead, understand this. The truth is revealed under pressure. We put pressure on a character in story for the sake of driving the character into a new understanding of a new truth. But it's also true of comedy. Comedy puts pressure on characters. The more pressure we put on them, the funnier the situation becomes. OK, we can take off the clothes. We can fill the audience with kids. What else can we do? Reach an orgasm. Sorry? Reach an orgasm. Reach an orgasm. I'm preaching so hard that I come. Is that what you're proposing? <laughs> OK, that's going to make me nervous. You feel motivated by the speech of the preacher. Yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you're good, dude. No. <laughs> No, you're, you're good because you're inside the character's mind. You're giving the character a real tough inner conflict. Let's just imagine there's somebody in the front row who is so transported by what the preacher is saying, as you say, that he or she is inspired to fulfillment, let us say. There's two thoughts in the preacher's head. What are they? How good I am, and how, I am. and how bad I am. And this creates inner conflict within the character. Just jot down those words, inner conflict, and recognize that inner conflict serves both to drive the character crazy, to keep him from his peace, but it also serves to generate tension within the audience. 
Because now the audience is looking at the circumstance and saying, I'm rooting for the preacher. I want him to succeed. But oh my God, it looks like he's succeeding too well. Now I don't know whether I want him to succeed or fail. I, in the audience, I am experiencing inner conflict. We will look at this again in the second uh, section of today's talk when we look at how to create comic characters and specifically how to create characters who inspire this exact inner conflict within the audience. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're still here on taboo. I want to use this tool a little bit more. What else can we do using only the tool of taboo to make this guy suffer? Anybody? He, he could have an erection. And by the way, just notice how much freedom we have in this room right now to talk about orgasm and nudity and erections. This is not necessarily uh, acceptable public discourse, right? You might not be aware of it, but I've changed the rules of the room just by introducing the idea of taboo and asking that we look at it not as something that we feel, but as something that we use. The minute I say taboo is a tool, we're actually set free from our own taboos. It has been said by me, the, <laughs> the trouble with too far is you never know you're going till you've gone. We could easily take this conversation too far, but it would be useful for us to do so because then we would at least know where tolerance ends and we can come back to just this side of it. In this case, it might be the difference. Am I okay? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's no, very useful. No problem, no problem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Just waving to a friend. Hi. <laughs> it might be the difference between showing tented trousers. Uh, I don't know how you translate that. Or showing uh, the real deal one might say. The first time you write this scene, you might write it with all the clothes off and conclude that might be a little too far. You get the same comic energy out of the impression or the, the, in, the inference of erection than showing the real thing. In fact, we can call this a tool as well. This tool is called ellipse. It's often um, punctuated as three dots. Ellipse is the part that's left out. When we say, um, oh, when we show the face of someone who's having an orgasm, rather than showing the equipment, that is an example of ellipse. We're giving the audience a little bit of room to solve the puzzle of the joke on their own. When you, when you hear a joke the first time, it's funny. When you hear it the second time, it's not funny. Why? Because you have already solved the puzzle of the joke. There is no work for you as the person listening to the joke. There is no work for you to do. <laughs> I, I got lost. I'll find my way back. I was just distracted. This is... I have so many issues, um, <laughs> so many issues. This is a good time to mention also that uh, if, you, if you say something to me and I ask you to say it again, it's not because you're speaking too softly, it's because I have really bad hearing, like hearing aid worthy hearing. As I said last night, this can be understood, actually I told it a different way last night, but I can, it can be understood this way. I lost my hearing along with my virginity my sanity and my memory at a Grateful Dead concert in, New, in uh, Madison Square Garden in 1979. <laughs> it was a great show, I'm told. <laughs> Parentheses. If I have bad hearing and I feel tension about it and I have the idea I can't let them know that I have bad hearing, how will that affect my performance? It'll make me nervous, it'll make me uh, tense, it'll make me feel like there is a lie that I have to defend and not reveal. The minute you know that I have a hearing problem, 
my problem goes away. I no longer have to worry about you finding out my secret. The reason that I mentioned this and put it in parentheses is that this goes very much to the psychology of the creator, of the writer. We're afraid people are going to find out we don't know what we're doing. You go into pitch, you're a nervous wreck. I'm, I'm bluffing here. I think I understand my idea, but I really don't. If you go in with a lot of nervousness that you are not willing to acknowledge, you put yourself on your own back foot. If you go in and the first thing you do is acknowledge what you're nervous about, suddenly no one can hurt you by finding out your secret. You've already revealed it. For me, this is a matter of, of saying to a group of people, okay, I have bad hearing, but also I'm afraid some of my jokes won't work. I'm actually not afraid of that. But if I tell you in advance that I I'm not 100% confident about what will happen next. I don't have to worry about you judging me negatively. Uh, Joan, you're a stand-up comic. What happens when a joke doesn't work? By the way, this is a comic tool. It's called telling a lie. <laughs> It's worth noting that you can often get humor out of a situation simply by saying the opposite of that which is true. I don't know. It's funny. It's not true. <laughs> so I'll ask again. Maybe I'll ask somebody else. You're a stand-up comic? <laughs> Say, what happens in your head when a joke doesn't work? Uh, I broke the space. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just admitted I don't understand Spanish. Oh, uh, tell him to use the microphone because otherwise he will not be understood. Boy, I just lost control of the room. I totally lost control. Good, I was hoping I would. Go ahead. Repeat the The question. Um, how does it feel when you're doing stand-up comedy and you tell a joke and the joke doesn't work? Bueno, en mi caso, bueno, uh, al meu cas realment som una mica especial, llavors em ric i destrueixo les coses. O sigui, trenco tot. <laughs> I la gent es queda parada i riu. Perquè... Però com si fos una equivocació. Uh, Hòstia, canvio el foco i ja... Ok. You... Uh, you have certainly seen stand-up comics who tell a joke and then freeze, like a deer in headlights. They know they told a joke that didn't work, they are suffering, but they are not acknowledging the suffering they're experiencing. And when that happens, the bond is broken between the audience and the stand-up comic. The audience experiences unbearable tension. I'm watching somebody fail, and if I continue to support that person, I'm experiencing the failure myself. How does a stand-up comic get out of that situation? Simply by acknowledging the failure. I have a friend who uses this strategy. He works in, in situation comedy in high-pressure environments sitting around a table with other very funny people trying to be funny. He knows he has to tell a lot of jokes. It's his job. But he also knows sometimes those jokes don't work. Whenever he hits one that doesn't work, he always says the same thing. Or something funny. <laughs> he acknowledges to the people around him using the tool of ellipse and giving them a problem, a little puzzle to solve, he says, I know that joke didn't work, I accept that it didn't work, and I'm prepared to move on. This is how the damage is repaired. You repair the damage by destroying everything. But what you're really communicating to the audience is, I saw it happen, and I'm responding to it openly and honestly. I want to say this again. I saw it happen, and I'm 
responding to it openly and honestly. I can think, did you just make it cooler? Good, good job. I can think of many, many human situations where that simple tool will make our lives better. I saw it happen, I made a mistake, I own the mistake. Anybody married? <laughs> then you know all about this. God, I went through it, I, I, I did it today. No, just today with my wife. I <laughs> can't believe I'm gonna say this, but of course I am. We, we left the, uh, the hotel to go sightseeing. We'd walked a couple of blocks and she said, I forgot my phone, I'm gonna to have to use your phone to take pictures. I said, that's not gonna work for me, <laughs> which was bad enough. Then I tried to buy it back. I said, no, 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 never mind, it's okay. I've come to terms with it. <laughs> oh, you've come to the terms with the fact that you want to, that I want to use your phone? I'm actually surprised we're still married after all these years. <laughs> Lost the plot. Oh, comic tools. <laughs> uh, acknowledging failure. So in such circumstances, when things blow up, it's always good to say, I saw it blowing up, I'm prepared to move on. The audience knows. The audience knows you failed. And whether that audience is a stand-up comedy audience or someone you're pitching to or just someone you're telling a joke to in a social situation. Yes? What about saying, oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, I, I was wrong. I, I didn't mean... Uh, the it, it amounts to the same thing. You say, uh, I didn't mean it. Uh, I didn't tell it right. You didn't hear it right. Um, there are a lot of ways to... to gain the audience's loyalty back. To or even being provocative. You could never understand. Right. I, I'm, I'm not surprised you're not laughing at that joke I just told. You must be stupid. <laughs> Telling a lie. Your audience is not stupid, and you're not actually calling them stupid. You're actually taking all of the blame on yourself. There's a, a documentary called Exporting Raymond, and it's the story of the making of the Russian version of Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, if you see the documentary, look for me. I'm in it for that long. Because while the Russians were making Everybody Loves Raymond, they were also making Married with Children. I was working on Married with Children, so I got to go to the party, the cast party, for Everybody Loves Raymond, and you can see me in the background, possibly wearing this jacket. <laughs> but the, the, the guy who made that film, the creator of the TV show, did a very smart thing. He never made any jokes about the Russians, even though they were the object of all the jokes. He made himself the object of all the jokes. The Russians aren't stupid, I'm just too dumb to understand what's going on. It's a very effective strategy. Anytime you attack yourself, you win. Anytime you attack somebody else, you get into a tough situation. You might succeed, but you can certainly succeed by taking the burden on yourself. I'm sorry you didn't understand that joke. I'm sorry you're so stupid. You're not really attacking the audience, you're attacking yourself. And then you build audience loyalty. Yes, sir. Question? No, just oh. random hand movement. When you're a trained professional, as I am, you become keenly aware of hands going up in the crowd, even if they're not, <laughs> because you're so desperate for the distraction. All right, exaggeration, taboo, ellipse. We're starting to build a toolkit. Let's add another tool. This is one of my favorites, Clash of Context. Clash of Context tells us that in any normal physical environment, there's a very narrow range of things that actually belong. And an almost infinite uh, array or list of things that do not belong. Let's put ourselves in a different situation. Let's find a new way to attack a new character's piece. Let's say that we're in a bar where uh, we'll be, we'll be even-handed we have a man and a woman who are trying to get together. They've made eye contact across the bar, and they heard music. 
and the lights are shining and the angels are singing, but we want to make them suffer. We want to hurt them. What do they want? What is their goal? To get together. Thank you. Now, what are the normal things we expect to see in a bar? So, waiter, waitress, what else? Other patrons, uh huh. A bar, drinks, glasses, drunk people, for sure. Music, uh huh. All of these things are the normal things of a, of a bar environment. Now, let's do a little math. Uh, unexpected physical thing plus making the character suffer equals funny. What uh, things that do not belong in that environment can we bring into the environment for the specific purpose of making it harder for the couple to get what they want, get together? The Sorry? The priest. The priest. Thank you. And that tool is called callback. Just while we're here, if it was funny before, and I say it again, it will be funny again. And maybe I'll just transport myself a few hours into the future and, uh, and say, thank you all for being here today. And oh, by the way, the priest. <laughs> God, oh, I, just, I just projected a joke three hours or two hours into the future. That's really weird. There's no chance I'll remember to do that. Maybe you'll help me. But... We just did some weird time traveling there. So we brought in the priest. It's callback, which is why it's funny in this situation, but also because the priest does not belong in the situation. Now, let's make the bad situation worse. Not just a priest, but a certain priest with a certain attitude. <laughs> High five. Yes, a priest with an erection. What else can we bring into this environment that does not belong? Yes. The guy's mother. The guy's mother, or the gal's mother, or the gal's father, or both. What else? Husband or wife. Husband or, <laughs> husband or wife. I haven't even thought of that. Which is worse, mother or wife? Wife. 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 Oh. Yeah, because with your mother, it's just disapproval. But with your wife, it's disapproval plus the end of life. <laughs> Exaggeration? Not in my relationship. <laughs> Uh, what else can we bring in? These are people. Let's bring in some physical things, yeah? Sorry? Kids. Kids. Kids, yep, uh-huh. As a distraction, what else? Screen TV. Uh, screen TV, uh-huh. With the volume turned up so loud that they can't talk. Oh, oh on mating. Oh, my. A documentary, National Geographic, I assume you're talking about, let's watch these hippos make love. <laughs> and, sorry, and both of them can see the picture on the screen yeah. over the shoulder of the other. Neither knows that the other can see the picture, but they're both doing what? They are suffering profoundly. And we don't have to wonder if that's funny. We already know, right? Just the mere mention of it makes us laugh. We can create the picture. We can intuit the suffering. We know how the characters are going to hurt. What else can we do? Just on the level of physical things that don't belong. A bicycle. A bicycle. And now let's uh, combine tools. We'll use bicycle plus exaggeration. What do we get? Sorry? Motorcycle. Uh, motorcycle. Thank you. That's great because a motorcycle is an exaggerated, it exaggerates the quality of two wheeled vehicle that does not belong. Boy, I'm just going to play that one back. Two wheeled, an exaggeration of the quality of two wheeled vehicle that does not belong. Bet you didn't expect to hear that sentence today. I certainly didn't expect to say it, but I hope you understand. I think you're starting to get it. When we set aside the hard, impossible question, how can I possibly be funny, and start asking simpler, more targeted, easily answered questions, what can we bring in here that doesn't belong? Suddenly, we never have to worry about having enough material. Our choices are limitless and abundant, and we're just getting started. 
because here's another comic tool. And this comic tool is inappropriate response. Just as there is a very small sector of things that physically belong in an environment, there's also a very small sector of behaviors or responses that belong in an environment. Let's go back to that bar and ask ourselves, what behavior do we expect to find? What's normal for a bar? Talk, buying somebody a drink, uh, sorry, talking, what else? F flirting, what? Listening to music, uh-huh. And what is, uh, what is an appropriate attitude for someone in a bar? Smoking. Sleeping in a bar? Sure, okay. What attitudes do not belong in a bar? Crying. Crying. Oh, crying. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's just imagine a, a boy and a girl are trying to get together. There's someone sitting next to them, a total stranger, someone we don't know, who suddenly starts crying uncontrollably. <laughs> it's inappropriate behavior, but what effect does it have? It attacks our hero's peace. They want to get together, but this crying woman, who turns out to be his mother <laughs> or his wife, this crying woman is inappropriate. She doesn't belong in the situation. Let's think about a funeral just for a moment. What behaviors are appropriate in a funeral? Silence, Silence respect. Laugh. Hmm? No, no. Oh, you're ahead of me. And, and laughter is an inappropriate behavior. What other inappropriate behaviors? Dancing. Can, mm -hmm, dancing, what else? Having, erection. Having an erection, there you go. Oh, Guess it just didn't work for her. <laughs> nah, she told me she was gonna leave. People do this, they, they take pains, I told this one last night, they, they take pains to warn me in advance when they're gonna leave because they're afraid of hurting my feelings. And I always tell them, I worked in Hollywood. I've been abused by much bigger people than you. <laughs> You're free. You're absolutely free now. Because if I say to you, come up with a joke in a bar, you're lost. You'll have to come up with something at random on your own. But if I say to you, think about a boy and a girl who want, together, want to get together, and think about the many different people in the bar and the different ways that their attitudes can keep the heroes from getting together, you're no longer being creative, you're just problem solving. And problem solving is easier for a couple of reasons. One, <laughs> it's just a more effective way of thinking, but more profoundly, if we're trying to be creative, our egos are engaged, totally engaged. And if we fail, our egos are damaged. But when we're problem solving, when we're analytical, when we're using tools, our egos aren't engaged. All we're asking ourselves is to write a list of things, and we know how to do that, and it doesn't hurt us to try and fail. And this is why I'm so fond of the idea of thinking of comedy in terms of problem solving. Eastern philosophy describes creativity as carrying buckets to the river. And it's a beautiful phrase, it's quite poetic, but to me it's inefficient. The only way I can get a creative solution is to carry buckets to the river where the creativity is passing by. Who's ever had the feeling of walking down the street and suddenly you just get hit in the head with a great idea? Like the clouds part and the sky turns blue and God reaches down from heaven and puts a joke in your head. Anybody had this experience? So you know what it's like, but it's not efficient. We can't wait for God to put jokes in our head, so we use tools to give ourselves a lot of raw material to work with without any ego investment at all. I could ask you to do this. I could ask you to, as an exercise, create a situation, find a character, assign that character a goal or desire, and then come up with 10 different ways to attack that character's piece 
keep him from achieving his goal. You could do that exercise in less than five minutes with 100% success. That's creative freedom. That's liberation from fear. That's liberation from insecurity. And, and whenever I use words like fear and insecurity, I, also get, I always get a little fearful and insecure because now I'm not talking about the technology of comedy. I'm talking about what goes on in a writer's head and a writer's heart. But I always come back to this because we cannot be effective creative practitioners if we do not understand what's going on inside ourselves. And we can be effective creative practitioners just by understanding what we are thinking and feeling. So we use tools to set ourselves free and we use uh, the power of the list and the rule of nine to generate a lot of solutions knowing that we don't need them all. Everybody with me so far? All right, let's hit a couple more comic tools. Um, oh, I know, I was gonna demonstrate it this way. Suppose I reach for a whiteboard marker and I start writing and I suddenly discover that it's not a whiteboard marker, but what? A permanent marker. This is called defeat of expectation. A character wants an outcome. He's moving toward that outcome. He thinks he's on the verge of success. Something unexpected happens. What happens to the character? He goes from feeling good to feeling bad. What happens to the audience? They laugh. Okay? Let's go back to our man and a woman in a bar. How can we solve this problem and come up with a joke just using the tool defeat of expectation? Yeah? The girl is not a girl. A girl is not a girl. Man, you are a brother from another mother. Because <laughs> because I was thinking exactly the same thing. Listen, before we go any farther, I have a question for you. <laughs> How liberal are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, the, it turns out that the girl is not a girl, or the boy is not a boy, or their brother and sister. That's a weird defeat of expectation, plus taboo. What else can we do? I walk into a room to teach a class. I see that the room is filled. There are 150 people waiting to see me. And I start talking. I get my groove on and everything's going well. Then somebody raises his hand and says, isn't this supposed to be a class in astrophysics? <laughs> my expectation, I will succeed, is defeated by new information. I want to lean on this phrase, new information, for a moment because it's not only a comic tool, it's also a storytelling tool. Everything we need to know about the structure of a story can be understood in the following piece of information. Story is the journey from one, inf edu sorry, from one emotional state to another emotional state across the bridge of new information. We're thinking about this couple in a bar. Now let's think about it not just as a joke, but a story. They're getting together. They're getting close. What is their feeling? How do they feel? Excited, happy, anticipation. This is working. This is going to work. Now we're going to defeat their expectation by introducing a new piece of information. Uh, before we go any further, don't you remember you slept with me last week? Or something funny. <laughs> See what I did there? Or here comes her wife, his wife, her husband, or maybe the other way around. This is the 21st century. Now the story has changed. The emotional state has changed. They went from feeling happy and excited to what? Frustrated, frightened. A new piece of information triggers a change in emotional state. Say this again for the camera. Story is built on the proposition that a new piece of information will trigger a change in emotional state. Apart from the comedy, this is a really useful piece of information for storytellers. Now we can look at everything that's happening in the story, and instead of wondering whether it, the event belongs in the story, we can ask, does the event 
trigger a change in emotional state? If the answer is yes, then it's fine. If the answer is no, then it's not a real story moment. Defeat of expectation, inappropriate response, taboo, exaggeration, callback. I think those are the basic comic tools. Are there any questions about this material while I surreptitiously sneak a look at my clock? Anybody? Questions? Yeah. yeah. For example, about talking, talking about defeat of expectation. I'll repeat it. Yeah. Talking about defeat of expectation. Here comes the, I was trying to cover. I thought we had a workaround. I thought we had a thing. Yeah. Okay, about talking, talking about defeat of expectation. We have this um, couple in the bar that are trying to, to meet. Up. Yeah. Um, and then the, um, the camera, or I don't know how to explain it, goes back, um, have a zoom back. Uh -huh. And then the girl is not going to him. It's going to... Oh, Another yes. one. That's that's sure, that that's, be the of that's the feat of expectation. Okay. Um, the way I understand it is the moment you've seen so many times before, where uh, in slow motion a couple is running toward each other in a field of flowers, and the music is playing, and the sun is shining, and she has her arms out, and he has his arms out, and she runs past him to his dog. That's the feat of expectation. Yes. Now, at at this point. I almost have to say, don't worry if it seems too easy. Because what you just said there completely solves the problem. Everything you need to know about writing comedy exists in the technology that you just used. But the problem is that the minute we start using this creative technology, the part of us that has relied on intuitive creativity up to this point begins to feel insecure. The proposition that we make to ourselves is, I have this natural creativity, and it's getting me some good results. But now there's this whole other way of thinking about things. And I see the benefit, but I also see that there's a danger. What is the danger? That everything will become like clockwork. That somehow the soul will be sucked out of it. I just want to tell you that Every single writer I've ever taught has crossed this exact bridge from the magic of creativity into the technology of creativity. And every single one has the same experience, the experience that you will have. For a very short period of time, while we're trying to think about creativity analytically, there will be an artificial kind of clockwork feel to our problem solving. But very soon after that, all of these tools will drop down underneath your creative process and support it from below. So that in the end, you'll have both the magic of creativity, God hitting you with a great idea, plus the technology of creativity that will allow you to support the magic of creativity more effectively. Going back to this idea of creativity being uh, Creativity is carrying buckets to the river. We're talking about building a dam, building a canal, uh, some, some irrigation pipes, some plumbing. We're just talking about taking the raw materials that are available to us and using them more efficiently. Taking the raw materials that are available to us and using them more efficiently in two ways. First by understanding the emotions that we will feel while we're using these tools, and second, by using the benefit of having so many more solutions available to us now. This is where you get pretty damn quickly once you start using tools. And I, I, I'm at pains to point out, I have my tools and I love them, but they're not the only tools that work. I really don't want you to come away from this saying, uh, I want to use the tools that John Vorhaus uses. Rather, I want you to come out of this experience saying, I want to use tools, because I see that there's benefit to using tools. Then there, if you're your tools, my tools, anybody else's tools, doesn't matter. You will undergo a change in your creative process, a change in your understanding of how you think, 
and a change in how you feel about yourself. You'll feel lighter, more relaxed, more comfortable with failure because you know every time you get stuck, there's a place you can turn to get unstuck. You don't have to examine a scene randomly. You can use Clash of Context. And when Clash of Context no longer serves you, you can take Taboo or Defeat of Expectation. Try one tool after another and apply them to the situation. You don't have to suffer for lack of solutions. You just don't have to suffer. May I say that this is my mission, like my big mission in life, to help creative people not suffer? <laughs> I've done enough suffering for you. <laughs> I've suffered plenty. But along the way, I asked myself, how can I make this easier? What can I do to be better than waiting for the magic of creativity? Why should my subconscious get all the good jokes? Why can't I problem solve? And so I find myself somewhere between a teacher and a preacher, I would say, <laughs> saying, use these tools because they are effective, but also saying, use these tools because they will transform your life for the better. That's the preacher part. And uh, if she hadn't left, that woman could have told you it's true, because I taught her 10 years ago. I'm not exactly sure why she left. All right, everybody with me? We're about to change topics. If there are any questions about this, we'll have at them, or then we'll move on. All right, let's move on. To understand comic characters, we start with understanding that each comic character has a thing called a comic filter. And for those of you who've read the comic toolbox in English, you might say, hey, didn't you used to call this comic perspective? Yes, I did, but perspective is three syllables and filter is only two. So 25 years later, I have really upped my game. <laughs> comic filter. In the early days of my working as a writer, my wife was my editor. I wrote sample scripts, first time scripts, and she read the scripts and she marked them up, told me what was working and what wasn't working. And uh, she was a sharp editor. She really knew her stuff. And also she was um, a, a descriptive editor. She could write a novel in the margins of a script and really explain to me what I was doing wrong. And I came to rely on that. And then um, every now and then <coughs> there would be no notes on the page, but just the words, let's talk. <laughs> and uh, if you can imagine that w we live in a house where my office is here and her office is there, and I'm looking at a script that says, let's talk, this is how I approach the meeting. I'm a dead man walking. <laughs> but one time I wrote a script and I put a joke in, and she said of this joke, I don't get it. And the next words out of my mouth, hand to God, then you must be stupid. Can you imagine saying such a thing to your wife, who is your editor, who is doing this job for free? Can you imagine that I slept on the couch for a little while? Yes, you can. Why did I say that? Because I was insecure, and it was easier to attack her than to admit my own insecurity or admit my own failure. I'm a little bit better about it now, a little bit better. But when you find yourself in that situation, remember, the person's not stupid. The person might be stupid for agreeing to be your editor, because that's a thankless job. But if you have that negative reaction, it's only your ego talking. I don't know how we got off on this. Let's try and get back on track. Comic filter. A comic filter is the comic character's single strong way of viewing and interpreting reality. A comic filter is the character's means of understanding and interacting with the world around him or her. Real people in the real world do not have such a strong comic filter because we're real people. We have desires, we have fears, we have expectations, we have needs, we have plans. We operate broadly in our own self-interest. 
The difference between comic characters and real people in the real world is that comic characters filter reality through their comic filter. That's how they're built. Examples of comic filters include greedy, needy, stupid, arrogant, asshole, alien, innocent, ignorant, clumsy, nervous, insecure. Almost any value you think can think about plus exaggeration equals comic filter. The way I like to demonstrate it this, is this. Um, somebody give me a comic filter, anyone you can think of. Sorry? A uh, hypochondriac, okay? Hypochondriac. How does a hypochondriac cross the street? Very carefully, not only that, what can we predict that the hypochondriac will do? Probably, you know the button you push? Probably going to put on gloves. Uh, what's an exaggeration? What's, what's more uh, protection of the environment? The mask, bigger? Helmet, bigger? Hazmat suit? Right. I would expect a true hypochondriac driven by his comic filter, I would expect that character not to leave the house without wearing a full decontamination suit. That is comic filter plus exaggeration. Let's try it again. What's another comic filter? Sorry? Taking a lot of medicines? Um, uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, addiction. Uh, how does an addict cross the street? I think probably over and over and over and over and over and over and over because he's an addict. Uh, give me another one. Intense. Loudly, please. Intensity. Intense. How does an intense person cross the street? <laughs> Intensely, right? <laughs> Comic filter does two things. It tells us how the character will behave, and it tells us how the character will be funny. If you have the comic filter, you know how that character will act. You know how the character will be funny. Now that you know me quite well, what would you say is my comic filter? Being funny. Being funny. The way I put it is the world is my circus. Everything that exists in the world exists to entertain me. Now, I know that's not true because I'm a real person in the real world. But now that I have this information, I can, if you will, reinvent myself as a comic character. We'll do this, uh, this uh, exercise in just a second, but let's pause for a moment and think about comic characters we know very well. Let's take Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory. People know this character? What's his comic filter? Nerd. Perfection. I think perfection. Who has the comic filter nerd in that same show? Yeah, the other guy. Leonard is his name. Uh, the, the blonde neighbor, what's her comic filter? Sexy. As we first meet her, we might say that her comic filter is blonde. That's a little unfair to the character. She is more than that. But it's an easy way of understanding. Um, what about... Um, Kramer from Seinfeld, what's his comic filter? Weird, weird. That's close, it's not quite it. I think his comic filter is, I'm Kramer. Enthusiastic, okay? And because he's enthusiastic, he does things that other people can't do. This is key to understanding what a comic character is really all about. The comic filter is, in a very real sense, the character's superpower. It makes it so that the character can do things that normal people can't do. Or the opposite. Yeah. The opposite. Uh, it, a man or a woman that can do anything. They can't do anything. You, yes, you can put it this way, but it kind of amounts to the same thing because a normal, a normal person um, cannot stay at home in a state of fear, is not ruled that way. A comic character 
as a slave to her comic filter, can have the superpower of never having to leave the house or never being able to leave the house. I feel like this might be a little bit of a semantic thing, so I'm going to sidestep it and ask the following question. What is your comic filter? When people say you're so funny, what is it about you that you are using to understand your reality that makes them laugh? Write that down. Go ahead. It's just like class. You do your homework and I will do a dance. Because the world is my circus and I can. My superpower. <laughs> I, I, am, I am being paid at this moment <coughs> professionally paid to dance badly. <laughs> if that's not a superpower, I don't know what is. So, Joan, what's your superpower? What's your comic filter? Oh, I think maybe to me self-deprecating. Self self My comic filter is self-deprecating. As a real person in the real world, he is appropriately self-deprecating. He takes that on when it's required to, he doesn't use it when it's not necessary or not relevant. But now, if we turn up the heat and turn him into the most self-deprecating person in the world, how does he cross a street? <laughs> Apologizing to everyone, and not just everyone, but everything. That is the comic exaggeration of the filter all the way to the end. Young lady, what is your name? Stephanie. Stephanie, what is your comic filter? I think OCD. <laughs> OCD. Okay, you're not, you're a little OCD. Oh, uh, yeah. Here's, here's, here's how I am OCD, exactly. Have you ever been in a room with, um, uh, with a bunch of tables arranged in a square? Oh, sorry, are we there? Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD. Oh, that reminds me of a joke, um, just to set it up. ADHD, uh, Attention Deficit, a, a, Attention Deficit Hyper Disorder, ADHD. This is a long way to set up a joke. How many ADHD kids does it take to change a light bulb? Let's go ride bikes. <laughs> To change a light bulb. <coughs> to change a light bulb. It's a light bulb joke. You know, how many naked virgins does it take to change a light bulb? How many do you have? <laughs> uh, sorry, my bad. My bad. Uh, young lady, what is your comic filter? I don't know. Don't know? Okay, take more time. Anybody else? What's your comic filter? No? No? No, don't know. Serious. serious, serious, serious. And if you take serious plus exaggeration, you get impossibly serious, inappropriately, unbearably serious. That's a character with some superpowers. That's a character who can go to a comedy show and sit there alone in the audience with her arms crossed saying, that's funny, that's funny, that's super funny. I'm having such a good time in a way that's completely inappropriate for everybody else, but perfect for her. And as we'll see in the second section, this is how we drive stories. By giving characters strong comic filters and then driving action straight through those filters. And for those of you who said, I don't know, I haven't figured it out, consider it to be your homework. Because even if you don't consider yourself to be really funny, you do have specific ways of looking at reality. Because you're a normal, well-adjusted person, those ways do not generally get in the way of your effectiveness. But a comic character can take that same way of looking at reality, extend it by exaggeration, and become impossible to function. That's what we want. Real people in the real world do things in the name of their self-interest, Comic characters in the comic world do things in the name of their self-image. They want their comic filter to win. Again, I'll go back to Sheldon Cooper in Big Bang Theory. 
his comic filter is, I'm the best, and I will prove it even if it costs me everything. And there are plenty of episodes of Big Bang Theory that demonstrate this, but one in particular comes to my mind when he finds himself in a competition, a, a quiz competition, against his friends. He so needs to be the one with the right answers that he ends up losing the very thing he set out to win. His comic filter tells us what he will do, how he will be funny, and ultimately it predicts the outcome. He will fail because of his comic filter. Everybody with me on this? And I said this business about homework, and I mean it. <laughs> I totally mean it. There's, there's value for you, I humbly suggest, in being here today, talking about these things, learning about these things. But the value will be much greater if you actually use it, like do your homework. Think about yourself, how you're funny, how you might exaggerate that part of yourself. Turn it into comic characters. Just broadly speaking, I hope you come out of this uh, master class uh, inspired to do this kind of work. Yes. Um, how, how would you put a character who is too much empathic? How do you, uh, what do you ask? A character that is too much Can you have a character empathic, um, who's too empathetic? Uh, come on down here and give me a hug. <laughs> I can tell that you need a hug. In fact, it's, there's a very good chance that you need more than a hug. Let's go out for tea. And after tea, we'll go to uh, the spa. And uh, um, I, I want to treat you to a massage because you look tense. Um, are you feeling OK? Do you feel like you might get a cold coming on? I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry to... to uh, go off topic like this, but this woman has a problem and she needs some help. <laughs> and because I am that empathetic, I am determined to help her. Imagine that I'm a comic character and I just suddenly stop teaching. Like I literally go to her, give her a hug, and take her out for tea. I have succeeded in obeying my comic filter, but failed in arriving at my own self-interest. And this is what comic characters do over and over again. And again, now you have a wonderful test. You can look at the actions in your story and ask yourself, is the character getting what he wants? Get rid of that. Is the character enslaved by his comic filter? That's where you want to be. Did I answer your question? I hope so. It was, uh, it was meta. See, totally meta, because I answered it by pretend. You know that. Yes, sir. Uh, I missed a little bit the, the, when you said the comic filter will tell us the end or something like that. You said it, it will tell us how the character will... It will tell uh, the... Uh, yes. It will how tell, will he be funny? How the character how will be funny, how the character will behave, and probably what the outcome will be. Let's see if we can... We can, uh, can it be a happy outcome? Can he succeed because of the comic filter? Or is... Oh. I, it, it can be. Let's test it. Let's go back to the, the boy and the girl who are trying to hook up in a bar. But let's give the boy a comic filter. Anyone will do. Greedy. Sorry? <coughs> greedy? Greedy. Okay. His comic filter is greedy. The most important thing to him is not spending his own money, but getting other people to spend their money. He reaches a point in the story where she says to him these words, why don't you pay the bill and we'll go back to my place? What is his goal? He wants to go back to her place. Will he get there? No, because now he's experiencing, again, inner conflict between his desire to achieve an outcome and his need to defend his comic filter his enslavement to his comic filter. What happens next? Uh, oh, I don't have my wallet. Yes, you do, it's right there. Oh, yeah, I don't have my wallet. I have my wallet, but I don't have my credit card. 
you have your phone, pay with your phone. Oh, I could do that. Uh, you know, in these days, often the woman pays. <laughs> yes, but then you don't go home with the woman. Oh, hmm. I, at that point, I think maybe he just runs out. He once goes to the bathroom, hoping she'll pay the bill. Uh, oh, this is uh, Alan Harper in, yeah. in Two and a Half Men. His need to not spend money is so strong that it will keep him, literally keep him from getting laid. So to your question, I think most of the time the character does not get a happy ending, at least in a sketch or in a comic moment situation. Why? Because we know that the job of the scene is to make the character suffer. And if the character gets a happy ending, the character stops suffering. Not true in film. We'll talk about that when we look at story structure. Not necessarily true in situation comedy, which we'll also talk about. But just in the comic moment, the, the comic filter, you can think of it this way. The comic filter is like a black hole that stands right in front of the character's face and warps reality, bends reality, so that reality doesn't get to the character in a real way. And because of that, the character misfunctions or malfunctions. And because of that malfunction, the character doesn't get what he wants. Let's turn it around. Let's give her a comic filter. What's a comic filter for her in this moment? She wants the same thing. She wants to hook up. What comic filter can we give her? Anyone will do. Insecure. Sorry? Insecure. Insecure. Perfect. What is the emotional need of an insecure person? To get approval. Okay? Now, again, we're driving inner conflict. She wants two different things, and they fight against each other. She wants to get laid, but she also wants approval. How will she act in the moment? Sorry, isn't it the same? Oh, getting laid and getting approval? It might very well be. <laughs> but I think... I think she's going to need a lot more approval than she has before she will let herself leave the bar. This is the, this is the comic moment I'm imagining. Before we leave, I just have to ask you one question. Will you still respect me in the morning? Yes, of course I will. What about next week? I think so. Next month? I don't know, I might not even know you next month. You're going to break up with me? We just started dating. Oh my God, you don't love me. Now the character falls apart. Not because the environment makes her fall apart, but because she sows the seeds of her own destruction. And isn't that wonderful? <laughs> isn't that wonderful? We started out by saying that our job is to attack a character's peace and make the character suffer. And now we find out that the most profound tool of all is the character's own flawed psychology, the character's own brokenness. Um, oh, well, we could do examples of this all day. But we're only starting to understand what comic characters are. Because a comic character will have this strong comic filter, and we can say that the comic filter equals superpower. Oh, I want to give you one more example of this. Suppose we have a mother of a gay son. And her comic filter is, my son is not gay. And she walks into her son's bedroom and finds him in bed with another man. Because she has a superpower, and that superpower is denial, she can say, how nice, you boys are having a sleepover. That's the way the comic filter is the character's superpower. Well, now, we're going to add two new elements, and these elements are flaws and humanity. Me, yes, sir. The, the Here comes the microphone. Thanks. Uh, about the comic filter, uh, I was going to ask, um, is it possible to apply a double filter to a character, or does it, uh, in a way, spoil the trick? Um, 
you, you, you're so, you're just like 30 seconds ahead of the game. Oh, sorry. Be, no, because uh, a, a strong comic character has a single strong comic filter, but also has these other qualities that we're going to explore that give texture and uh, dimensionality to the comic filter. Do you have an example in mind? I, I'm happy not, to test the really, proposition. Not really, but if you said about Sheldon Cooper, He's perfectionist, but he's always right, so he's proud at the same time. Yes. And I and don't it's know if it's and a you don't know which is which. Okay. If you are creating comic characters from nothing at all, you're building them from the start, often you start by saying, I think the comic filter is perfectionist. And then you work with the character, you develop the character, you put him in story, and you realize maybe the word we're looking for is arrogant or maybe the word we're looking for is too proud. The definition changes a little bit, and it, it's not really necessary that you nail it down to a word, unless you're pitching to a network, and they want to know what that word is, or else you can sound smart by telling them they want to know what that word is. Um, so there's room for nuance in the space. The key is whatever the character's attitude or sum of attitudes is, it absolutely controls them and enslaves them. Sir? Yes, what about the reverse? Sorry. What about the reverse of the superpower? I mean, in the case of Sheldon Cooper, he's very talented, he's very perfectionist, mm -hmm. but he's also alone. He's sad, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you, are, you feel shame for him. Mm -hmm. um, ah, now I have <laughs> two microphones. That's how powerful I am. Uh, I, that's related to this idea that in service of his self-image, he will do things that defeat his self-interest. And we do feel sorry for him. Let me save that for storytelling, for story structure, because you're onto something. Um, let me put it this way. That's an excellent question. Moving on. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not quite prepared to answer that yet. I think if we add a couple more pieces of information, a lot of, this, a lot of these questions, uh, uh, a lot will become clearer. Okay? A comic character has, as a headline, this thing called a comic filter. And then, to make the character a complete and real person, we're going to give the character a set of qualities or attributes. Actually, two sets of qualities or attributes. We're going to give the character flaws, and we're going to give the character humanity. I'm going to define these things and then break them down. Flaws are negative qualities or qualities of separation, qualities that define the character as someone other than us. Too tall, too short, too fat, too thin, funny hair, no hair, um, clumsy, bad dresser, bad breath. All of these things have the effect of creating emotional distance between the character and the audience. And the reason we create this emotional distance by design, by technology, is a thing isn't funny to the person it's happening to, the audience wants to laugh at the person it's happening to. They need to feel safe. And the way we make them feel safe is to communicate to them, if you look at this character, you will see he is not like you. Hold on to that. I'm going to define humanity, then we'll circle back to flaws. Humanity is the character's positive qualities, qualities that make the audience make an emotional commitment to the character best understood as sympathy or empathy. Sympathy, I like that guy. Empathy, I am like that guy. We endow the character with positive qualities so that the audience will make an emotional bond with the character. If they make the emotional bond, they will be interested in the outcome. As in the case of Sheldon Cooper, I'll feel sorry for him or sad for him when a bad thing happens. My heart will go out to him. This is so devious. I love this. Because on the one hand, we're giving the character flaws so that the audience will feel safe enough to laugh. On the other hand, we're giving the character humanity, positive qualities, so that the audience will care enough to commit. 
And while all of this is going on, we are also giving the audience inner conflict. On one hand, I hate that guy because he's such a dick. But on the other hand, I love that guy because he loves his mother. Now, what do I feel inside as a member of the audience? Inner conflict, tension, tension that is stored and ready to be exploded in the form of laughs. We create these comic characters using this technology, not just to create a well-rounded character, but also to put the audience in a situation where they just never feel comfortable with what the character is doing. If they never feel comfortable, they always feel tense, and they're always ready to laugh. All right, let's look at Sheldon Cooper. What are his negative qualities? Why do we not like him? He's arrogant. What else? Egotistical. What else? Not polite at all. What else? Doesn't respect other people's opinions. Has no... He's cruel. He's cruel. He can be cruel. What else? He's childish. He doesn't feel... He, he's, he doesn't feel anything. He's not empathetic. Therefore, we don't like him. But he needs a hug too, right? You're so alone back there. Why don't you come down and join the rest of us? No, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I'm... I'm just messing with you. All right, so those are his negative qualities. What are his positive qualities? Why do we like him? He's talented. What else? He's brilliant. What else? He's alone. Huh? He's alone. He's alone? Is that what you said? He's lonely. We feel his lonely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? He's funny. He's funny. For sure. He's funny. According to him, he's funny. I'm sorry? Super. Super. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. What else? He's different. He's unique. Special, we could say. I'm sorry? He's passionate. He's passionate. Thank you. Passionate. That's a good one. It's hard to hate a character who's passionate, even if he's passionate about the wrong thing. The example I always use in this case, again from the book, Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs. He's a terrible person. He's a cannibal. That's a negative quality. <laughs> On the other hand, he's very passionate. He will stop at nothing to eat your face. And even if you think that goal is a bad goal, you kind of admire that he's willing to do everything to achieve his goal. This is a, let's just highlight this. Strength of will is a key character strength, a key character humanity. If you give any character a strong will or passion or determination, you can give them all the negative qualities in the world and the audience will still like them because that passion is so attractive. I'm sorry? Like Dr. House. Like Dr. House, exactly. Um, Don Corleone. Who? Don Corleone. Don Corleone. Or Don Quixote. Or Walter White. Walter, Walter White. Great example of a character with bad goals, but a strong determination to achieve those goals. And while we're looking at Walter White and Don Corleone, let us note that we can use this means of character construction for characters who are not funny. The very same technology will create well-rounded, multi-dimensional, dramatic characters. The only difference is they don't have a comic filter that is enslaving them. Something to think about. You thought you were here to think about writing comedy, but you just learned something about writing drama. Drama is comedy minus exaggeration. Oh, see, I, that's the commutative property of mathematics, as if I understood what those words mean. Uh, I want you to focus on two words, childish and childlike. Sheldon Cooper is childish in his behaviors and childlike in his appreciation of the world. And it might be hard, especially when you're translating, I don't know if there's a difference in Spanish between childish and childlike, but it is worth noting that a character can have qualities that are flaws in one sense, but humanity in another sense. And often the, dis the difference is just a matter of appropriateness. If a character is appropriately childlike, it's a positive quality. If the character's childlike behavior is exaggerated to the point where it's inappropriate, then it becomes a negative quality. Um, Phoebe Buffay from Friends is, is an example of this. Her naivete 
is a very charming quality. We like that she's naive, but we also, uh, it gives us problems. She's so naive that she seems stupid. While we're looking at that character, taking things one level deeper, what is her comic filter? Naive, right? Why is she naive? No? From her life. She has developed innocence as a defense against her reality, as a protection of her reality. Same with Sheldon Cooper. He has developed arrogance and perfectionism as a defense against what fear? They're going to find out I'm no good. They're going to find out that I'm less. I have to protect myself psychologically from that outcome, and I will do it with my comic filter. So among the other things that a comic filter does, it serves as a character's front line of defense against reality. A lot going on here, and a lot of it is operating on the level of psychology. I encourage you to think about it on that level. This is where characters stop being constructed and start being real. Because you can create comic characters out of thin air in two seconds just by saying, what's a comic filter? What are some flaws that are harmonic to that comic filter? What are some uh, humanity, positive qualities that counteract those flaws? Next thing you know, you have a comic character. And you can do this all day, every day. We're going to do a little bit of it in the second part when we start looking at the relationship between comic characters and story. But for your purposes, you can re uh, uh, repeat this math experiment over and over and over again. But when you add that level of psychology, that sense of what's really making the character suffer, and how is the character defending himself against that suffering, that's when the character stops being a construction, a golem, if you know this word, golem, anybody? Um, an artificial human without soul, created by a rabbi in Prague a thousand years ago, as I know from a previous life. The character stops being a robot, let's put it in those terms, and becomes a real person. You breathe life into the character by examining the character's psychology. All right, so we have a character with a strong comic filter, a series of flaws, and a series of humanity, positive qualities. We've created inner conflict within the character because his flaws and humanity are at war with each other. We've created inner conflict within the audience because they don't know whether to love the guy or hate the guy. And we come up with a grab that explains the whole thing. If you want to create comic characters that you know will work, think about these two words. Sympathetic monster. A character who you can look at and say, that's a sympathetic monster. I love him and I hate him at the same time. That's a comic character who will work. If you have a character that you don't yet see as a sympathetic monster, just increase the exaggeration. Just turn up the volume on a character and move him further and further away from normal. Eventually, he'll be so far away from normal that he will emerge as a legitimate, sympathetic monster, like looking at one of those 3D magic eye photographs. You look at it, and it doesn't, you, you can't see the hidden drawing, and then you take a step back and take a drink or two, and then the magic uh, inner drawing appears, the 3D image pops out. This is what happens. You take a comic character, if he's not funny enough, Simply exaggerate his qualities. Eventually, he will become funny. If you exaggerate too far, you can dial it back down. It's completely scalable. But this is how you create these things called sympathetic monsters. And when you have a sympathetic monster, then you have a comic character who works. All right. We're going to um, ramp out into the break now. The, the, the plan, as I understand it, is this. Uh, we're going to take 15 or 20 minutes to mill about. And... Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to take one more question before the break, but I reserve the right to take this question psychically. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. Yes, that is an excellent question. I do have books for sale. 